Hello. Hello. <laughs> good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Yes. And today we have a very special person as our guest. It's none other than um, Roger. I mean, when it comes to post trails and Roger, it's a very long journey. He was one of our very first, you know, when we started with our exhibitions, he was uh, I asked him, the only connection was Facebook and without saying any kind of, not even asking any further questions, he was a part of our exhibition. And from there onwards, be it as a form of interview, be it as a form of article, be it as a form of a small short video, anything. And you cannot believe he got so much experience in the field of photography and being an icon ambassador for so many years. Absolutely no attitude, a spectacular human being. What more, Hermi? Yeah, from last 14 years, uh, Roger was, uh, Roger is an uh, icon ambassador and uh, he's working in the uh, Arctic part, like Norwegian part. I dream. And Yes, uh, any any photographer's dream location Dreamland, be yeah. in the Svalbard and polar bears. So and certain uh, images, man, you are going to see. Uh, it's going mm, to be a visual dream yes, yes. for next two or two and a half hours. It, you will yeah. enjoy every bit of it. So let's welcome uh, Roger to the show and let's hear from him. Yes. So let's welcome. Uh, Hi there. Hey. Hi. Let's hear from him. Yeah. Yeah. So let's welcome. Uh, Hi there. Hey. I think there's an echo. Yeah, there's an echo on, on the sound. I can hear you a little bit uh, more. Yeah, nice, so but uh, Misha, is there your. Oh, nothing from my side. Yeah, there's an echo on, on the sound. I can hear you a little bit uh, more. Yeah, nice, but, uh, uh, Misha, is there your. Oh, nothing from my side. Roger, any windows open? Yeah, I can still hear my, my voice uh, the first thing I uh, told you, but uh, I will I will talk on anyhow. Roger, any windows open? Uh, do you have an additional window open, maybe another computer or a, uh, uh, another window? No. Yes, you guys? Do you have an additional window open? I think it's logging in again. Okay. Okay, by that time, let me just share this window in all the possible places. Yeah. Okay, so there was some issue uh, in Roger's connection. Idea. I think he's coming back. Um, yeah. So let's wait. Let's wait. Wait for Roger. Yes. Yeah. In fact, we have uh, done some like one interview with Roger a couple of uh, years back. I think uh, so in our post wait, wait for Roger. Yes. Yeah, in fact, we have. Uh, did Did you open? Yeah, I just opened. Sorry. Now, no. are you able to hear anything? No, no, no. No. Yeah. That's why it's always better to use headphones. Oh, sorry for that. I think I, I better use that. Yeah, Roger is back. Let me add to use headphones. Oh, sorry for that. Yeah, that's okay. I better use that. Yeah. Anyhow, I'm live from Norway, um, and if you look at the map, I am straight on the, the polar circle. Uh, so that means from... I'm live from Norway, and if you look at the map, I am straight on the, the polar circle. Uh, Roger, do you have a headphone by any chance? Not with me, sorry. Uh, Roger, do you have a headphone by any chance? No, no, let me. Sorry. Uh, Roger, do you have a uh, headphone? Any chance? No, no, let me. Sorry. Yeah, I think the sound is coming from. 
It's going in a loop. Yeah. I think the sound is coming from the It's going in a loop. Yeah. I think the sound is coming from the in a loop. Yeah. The sound is going in a loop. Yeah. The sound is When I mute Roger, it's it's stopping. I think uh, it's the uh, echo of uh, the laptop or computer speaker. Oh, it's, it's stopping. I think uh, it's the uh, echo of uh, the laptop or computer speaker. Oh, it's, it's stopping. I think uh, it's the uh, echo of. Uh... So, is there any other uh, the video opened anywhere in, in any other tab? Roger. Is it gone now? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is gone. Magic. OK, then start again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to say that um, I'm almost on the polar circle. That means uh, from tomorrow, we have the, the midnight sun from this part of Norway and up north. So uh, yesterday I was up here and fly a helicopter over the second most largest um, the glacier in Norway. Okay. And take some pictures for a big exhibition that I was supposed to have in September this year. And this day have been eight hours beneath the earth in a big cave. Uh, okay. Climbing and I'm a quite big guy, 100 okay. kilo and 1.9 okay. meters. So I was like warm. <laughs> And it's quite <laughs> difficult to take cool pictures under in in a black sur surrounded cave, um, but I use some special lights, so I think I have some some good uh, pictures on the marble cave actually. So wow. it's a blast. Yeah. So uh, some of the audience want to know like how you came into photography and where it started. And that's a good question. I'm, I'm quite old. I'm 85 years old. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Um, but actually, um, I was a musician. Um, like I, I've studied music and played for the full time for 12 years. And when I was uh, around 30, I was um, I was playing with artists quite famous in Norway and the Nordic countries. So there was like a stress a lot. Um, you you travel a lot, but you couldn't, you couldn't see anything. So nature was my cathedral. I was uh, every spare time I had, I went out in the nature, of course, taking pictures, but only for myself. No ID to actually um, to be where I'm today. Uh -huh. um, and I was quite sick uh, when I was 31 or two years old, I think. So I had one year off. Um, and after that, I was thinking, OK, if I survive that illness I had, I will stop uh, stress around. I will try to well, not try, but I will uh, do something else. So if you have met me when I was 20 years old, that means 32 years ago. And if you told me then that uh, I will talk to you guys about nature photography in 32 years from, from that time, I would say, no. <laughs> I, was I was a bass player. I was all into music. Um, but um, when I look around or turn around and I look that direction, it's a perfect path, actually, because um, I was always out in the nature, uh, reading about the nature. Um, so I study everything about the nature. So I um, took the, the step out actually to be a journalist and uh, taking up the camera. So it was quite easy to, to follow my dreams. And I started, uh, let's say, 25 years ago. And 20 years ago, I was a pro nature photographer, only in nature all the way. So um, uh, long, st long answer to a good um, at question. Um, but um, after five years, I think, uh, that means 16, seven years ago, 16, 17 years ago, yeah. um, and I took the full step on only doing the nature on, on my own kind of okay. Okay. premises. And uh, I already mentioned that I've been a Nikon ambassador for some years now. I think it's 15 years now. Oh, uh, that's so that's because, yeah. <laughs> Because when and when I started, there was I think ten ambassadors in Norway, around eight ten ambassadors in Sweden and Finland and yeah in the Nordic countries. Okay. Uh, and after a couple of years, they had to 
Yeah, they, they told me, I think, they are supposed to have one ambassador for maybe one to two years. Yes. And they will try another, or that was the way they, they want to do it. So every time uh, some of my colleagues were kicked out or <laughs> whatever, <laughs> I was thinking, oh, next year is my turn. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that was uh, 10 years ago. Or so. Oh, OK. So actually, uh, from uh, June last year, uh, first, I think I was in Icon Ambassador in Norway for seven, eight years. And for the Nordic countries, that mean the north of Europe, yeah. five years and something. And last summer, they called me from from the main company in Japan. So wow. uh, the last year, I've been a global ambassador. So that's Wow, like, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, because um, the year 2019, I have 328 traveling days around the world. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but uh, still, um, I use maybe four to five weeks in India every year, uh, Sri Lanka, uh -huh. um, Africa, of course, different places yeah. and in Norway. But uh, the, um, the COVID-19 hit us quite hard. hard. Yeah. yeah. So actually, I was in in Japan in February last year, um, and then we heard the first news about the COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, everyone have a mask, so that was not so so big. And we heard this was up in China. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, they have a flu, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little did little did me know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Be so actually, um, and before the uh, the pandemic um, hit us, I was living in in Oslo, the main capital in in Norway. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and in Oslo, is, the nature is quite close. Uh, from my house or my apartment in the center of the city, it take, take me or took me maybe twenty minutes uh, out out in the forest. It's quite a narrow, small city. Oh. Uh, anyhow, uh, but um, after the pandemic, I think the twelfth of May last year, I um, moved out to mountain um, farm up in the mountains of Dobre. Um, the place we have them, the muskoxes. I have been up there for I think eighteen years. I have a workshop and the pictures of the the muskox, okay. the foxes and the moose and all the birds, the live wildlife out there. So after eighteen years, I was like, okay, I got to move up there because there's no point to no leave. travel. Yeah. So um, that, that I think that the best thing that happened to me during the the pandemic, I moved up in a, a quite small mountain farm by myself. Oh. Nice. I hope we 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 are really looking forward for your that journey as well at some point of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so you want to connect the uh, presentation? Yeah, I will um, put it up here. Let's see. Yeah. Um. Here we go. Do you see it now? Mm, not yet. Not yet. Okay, then I have to try again on share. Yeah. Share screen. Yeah. And do you see it now? Mm, not yet. Is it full screen? Because if it is going to be full screen, then uh, you will not be able to see it. So you need to. I see my full screen actually. So uh, I no, no, yeah, that is the problem. So if it is full screen, then it will not show in inside. Uh, yeah, you can, can you connect. Exit, exit, exit from the full screen and then connect. Then connect. Then once it is connected, you can go back to full screen. Okay, let's try again. It's gonna be the first thing for everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, share screen. Let's see. Um, share screen window. Mm -hmm. Yes, and here we go. Let's start this one. Can you see it now? Oh, no, not yet. That was strange. Yeah, after you uh, quit the... Uh... Yeah, yeah, it's, it it's there now. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now you can make it full screen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So here we go. Uh, this is my my main gear when I'm out traveling. Ooh. <laughs> uh, Ooh. It's, it's not so much, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so you travel with all this? <laughs> yeah, more or less. 
But actually, yeah. the, the the most important thing in that picture is uh, not myself, but the the guy or the, the girl up up front. Um, but the, the main optic or the main lens are the 600 millimeter. Uh, the last time I checked, I used that, I think, for 75% of, of my pictures. So that's always with me. Oh. So um, when I'm out to traveling, let's say up here, I have the, the 800, the 600, the 800 to 400, and of course, from the bottom, the 14 to 24, 24 to 70, 70 to 200, and some macro and some knives and some shit. So um, it's quite heavy, so to speak, but um, still. And mm -hmm. that, that's the, the, the only thing that I don't <laughs> like to be ambassador because I have everything, so I want to use everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember seeing you in Africa with a lot of bags around you. Yeah, I think they're the, the most expensive car in Kenya for those two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, yeah. uh, I was talking about the last trip I did before the pandemic, and that was in Japan. I was down there to, um, to, um, to make a workshop for this year. That ain't gonna happen, but I was down there for to to prepare um, to find the places. Mm -hmm. And if you like, you look closely, you see uh, two monkeys. I am to the right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> <laughs> and no, I was uh, also up in Hokkaido to to find the best way and way to, um, to to take picture of the stellar seagull. And uh, big birds, and up there in February, they have maybe a couple of hundreds of them flying around. Oh. And up in Norway, we have quite a lot of the, the white tail eagle. Um, but these guys uh, have actually two more uh, tail feathers, so they, they can fly like mosquitoes really fast and can turn around on, uh, <laughs> on the coin. And of course, the, the red headed uh, cranes, also up in Hokkaido. So all those things I was preparing to have a workshop this year and next year. So I hope maybe next year I'm going to go back and, and have a workshop taking oh. people from Europe and down to okay. Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the snow market was uh, a blast. I was up there a couple of days. And um, and actually I'll talk about my, my main gear, my 600 millimeter, but this is taken with the 200 Aperture 2. Also, one of my favorites for them for many years. Mm -hmm. I like the, the aperture that gives. And uh, what, what's quite cool about this monkeys, they, are, they can dive. So, this is taken actually with a 7200 with um, the polar filter to actually to take the uh, some of the reflection away okay. so you can see it underwater. And of course, those pictures. Um, <laughs> it's not easy to take them, but uh, still, uh, if, because they are, yeah. <laughs> try to have the water out and that take them maybe one or two seconds every time so you have to find one monkey and just stick with it and hopefully mm. have some rock and roll pictures um i love the the the, the spring um and for the last 10 years i um, used four to five weeks in india in may um, yeah a april march may and into may and when I go, uh, when I fly down there, let's say in the end of March, whatever, and come back in the middle of May, the spring in Norway is actually finished <laughs> <laughs> because we have snow maybe to the end of April and the first couple of weeks in May, the spring is on and summer starts in June maybe. So those guys, the the, the, the black goose, have the uh, the mating season in those weeks. So last year and this year, I used a lot of days or so weeks actually. On my stomach, on the wetland, to have those guys fighting on on the females. Beautiful light. Yeah, and one of my call it speciality, or whatever. I like a low angle, and that means low angle. <laughs> not half a meter, not fifteen centimeters. Like to actually dig your the lenses down in the in the wetland. Okay. So. So here we go, and uh, that smoke. Uh, that's like quite quite cool. And to have that uh, up here, you have to actually lay your, on your stomach as low as, as it gets. <laughs> if you have the camera half a meter up, up, above the, the level of the, the land, <laughs> you, you miss that, that smoke. So, so you have to wash my clothes quite often, um, <laughs> all the time. And we talk about beers. I will show some pictures from, from last summer uh, in Finland. I spent uh, maybe for two to four weeks every year, I don't know, maybe five or some years, but uh, at least three weeks every year in Finland. And I hopefully go back in July to have a three workshop and work alone between those three workshops. 
So if you don't uh, have had the have had visits from the Christmas or so, sorry the Santa Claus this last Christmas, that because the reindeer is killed by this bear. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me for my bad humor, but uh, oh no, it's actually timed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and no, uh, what's uh, quite funny because um, the first time I, I visited Finland, I think that was 18, 19 years and so I think. Uh, and the first week I was up there um, by my by my by my yeah, by myself, I was happy. I have a bear in the middle of the, the frame, and that was it. And the next year I tried to think uh, some new angles, get closer, use more time, and for every year. I have some new crazy idea how I will try to get some some new pictures. So uh, five, five, I think five years ago, I built a new uh, photo hide, and we call it a suicide hide. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can laugh, but it's quite <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny because a normal photo hide you uh, sit on your button on a chair and have the photo and the lenses out. Let's say it's eighteen, maybe one meter above the the, the land level. Yeah. And the build this one uh, is a little tower, uh, 80 centimeters um, on every wall. And you can see two cameras in the front, two on the left, two on the left, no, sorry, right and left, and one behind me. And the most important thing on the ground level, you see a, a 600. So I will go down there and take these this picture, pictures. Because normally oh. you have quite a whole angle. Now the first time I, uh, I used that the uh, suicide hide, we call it. Uh, I was alone on a quite big wetland, and a bear was staring right on me, and start dr drooling. Wow! And I was thinking to myself, was that a good idea? <laughs> but anyhow, uh, another bear come along, and quite big one that too. And it was looking on this quite rare box in the middle of the wetland, and was running straight against me. Oof. Oof. And I was quite happy because I, I put out a dead moose between us two, so I stopped on. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that was a good day at the office. But uh, once again, I like the low angle that's um, making the whole day. Here also uh, another suicide hide uh, because uh, those uh, small heights they are I think the weight between sixty and seventy kilos, so you can actually. Not carry around, but you can more or less take it around where you want it. And this week I had the, the idea to have uh, the backlight. I have a lot of mosquitoes, I can see some millions. Mm, and, yeah. yeah, and I used my 200 aperture two. That means uh, the depth of field are as small as, <laughs> as it gets, but I like the feeling. So if I have a foreground, I will use my 200 aperture two because they can shoot through the, the foreground. And have the the, um, the the bouquet like butter. Um, I really yeah. like that optics. So, um, but uh, your neck is gonna almost broke. It will break. But uh, <laughs> still, if I have a, an idea, I will stick to it and finished. And uh, two years ago, um, I was um, used my winter time some weeks to think about some new ideas, and <laughs> that I called the Rogers Bear Box. Uh, I haven't uh, ever have uh, sorry I haven't produced it myself but I've designed it uh, it's a uh, pure steel and uh, I think it's gonna be uh, you're taking maybe 2,000 maybe 3,000 kilos pressure so it's quite uh, heavy so inside I have a d6 now and a 2470 the no, sorry 14 to 24 aperture 28 and I use yeah. the pocket, pocket wizard um, and actually, I'm in a small tent, um, eight meters from the bear and the bear box. And and I use the the, tri the trigger or the, the pocket buster to shoot when it's quite close. Oh, so this was the first time I tried the bear box, oh. and I used a small piece of salmon underneath the the lens. Uh, and it took some some time, also some hours, to have the bear quite close. Uh -huh. Uh, and actually, I, I could, or I'm quite not, let's say, um, old-fashioned. I could use some camera ranger and sit um, pimping some red wine and look at my screen and press the button. But I like the idea to put out the camera, have a plan, uh, some backlight or whatever, and triggered my the camera myself. And the, 
excitement to actually go out maybe a two hour, hours later or the next morning and look at the uh, the memory card that's a quite uh, a sensation feeling because <laughs> it, it's uh, down there drinking wine or whatever and you just press the button or you see it okay everything's gone by itself triggered the beer or whatever i like to go out there and have to actually wait for the for the picture okay so uh, once again, uh, and in this area, I was all by myself. I put out some a little piece of salmon, a little small piece. And this bear come actually, um, I think four times. Uh, was away maybe for half an hour or two hours. Come back again and took out a new piece. So um, quite sensational. Um, once again, I was laying eight meters away and breathing. I'm not afraid of it. That was um, it's a good day at the office. And actually, I was <laughs> walking out again. I was maybe wait for 20 minutes or half an hour, and I was waiting. I think 45 minutes. The bear went, walked away, and went out to put out some more salmon. And the bear actually arrived at me, <laughs> and I started talking to me, to him and said, "Okay, if you want to see the new Nikon D6, you have to wait <laughs> a little bit more." <laughs> So it's turning around and actually it was coming back, I think, 10 minutes later. So we, we have a question from uh, Graphite and Paper. How yeah. do you focus the bear when you use the box with trigger? Is it autofocus? Good question. No, actually, uh, I am up, um, have the focus on the, on the uh, 30 centimeters. That's the closest you can focus on the 14 to 24. Yeah. I use aperture between 9 and 11 because I knew that uh, the whole bear is going to be sharp. Uh, the shutter speed uh, are between 320 and 640 of a second. And I use the ISO, uh, auto ISO. This is the only way or the only place that they use auto and everything that's on the ISO. Uh, and But I have a max uh, range on that for, I think, 3200 ISO. Okay. And then I'm out on this location, I can actually go out again because uh, that um, exposure could suit maybe between five o'clock and into the seven o'clock, maybe half past seven. After that again, I will walk out and go down on the uh, shutter speed, maybe to yeah, 320 maybe. Oh. And it's instead of aperture 11, I go down to maybe 5.6 and oh. press the, uh, the ISO up to 3002 bits. Normally, I do, do anything and then the manual. Uh, I will close or focus. Oh, sorry, I will, uh, <laughs> I will focus on, on the near, 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 nearest point. That means 30 centimeters something because of the bear is quite close. He yeah. put his nose actually up into the lens. Okay. And uh, one more question How many yeah. days, I, how many days uh, you had spent in the su suicide hide? And how do you prepare for that? <laughs> Okay, that was also a good question. Um, I've, I've been to the suicide hurry, I think, the, for, for three days. Um, the, the, the tower, that's quite narrow, but we also have, uh, you can have a box on the ground so you can actually sleep in there. It's quite hot, so you have to pee on the bottle, we have to <laughs> do everything in the bucket, and it's quite hot, so a lot of water. Of course, you can get, go out uh, during the day, maybe, but uh, I spend hours and hours. And actually, this was an, also in Finland. Um, the bear that you see behind okay. there, I was on my, on my way to put up my suicide hide in the midday. And between 10 in the morning and let's say 3 in the afternoon, the bear is sleeping hmm. normally. Okay. Uh, so I was digging my, uh, my uh, suicide hide on the right spot. And actually, I could feel that somebody looked at me. <laughs> I was like, OK. And okay, 20 meters behind me, the big <laughs> bear. And the guy that was, that was helping me, it, it told me that uh, there's one bear up there they, they call the, the troublemaker. Because oh. the week before, I think, he had um, and break into another photo hide and steal some food. And so I didn't know if that was this um, troublemaker or some other bear. <laughs> and this was the, the troublemaker. So he, he walked around me to two rounds, I think, and then he walked away. <laughs> Most because I use Nikon the D6 and the new 8, uh, 180 to 400, so he, he, he let me live. <laughs> but uh, to, to try not to, to laugh the, the, the whole thing away, because if this had have, have, have happened, sorry, have happened for yeah. less, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 
I will be like Forrest Gump. I will run like a small girl or small boy. <laughs> so I've worked with Barry quite a lot, so I, I can I can sense the, um, the 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 feeling of them or whatever. I'm not trying to to talk to them or try to. Or this this Barry is a friend of mine or whatever. I uh, treat them like a wild animal. Yeah. And I was, uh, but before I was laying down, I was thinking, okay, I will I can run to my car. That's let's say six hundred meters away. But I knew that the bear is faster than me when I started running. I will. Mm -hmm. I, I could crawl, uh, climb up in a tree. But this bear is also a good climber, so that's <laughs> also good, not a good idea. So my plan C was to lay down, take some pictures, and that was the best way. So stay calm, uh, not run away or whatever. Just stay calm. So that's uh, yeah. the best thing to do when you see a bear. Have you ever had any difficult situations with bears? Any um, attack? Uh, <laughs> the, the polar bear, yeah. Because uh, the, the, the brown bear don't look at people uh, as food. And, okay. uh, if this, uh, this is a male, if it had be a female with cubs, then I will... Uh, <clears throat> Move slowly the other direction, but I knew in this area is um, more more or less only males. Um, mm -hmm. But I have some uh, close encounter with them uh, on 5, 10, 15 meters. Uh, but still, if you knew what you have to do, stay calm. Don't look at it or at them. Don't talk to them. Just look on the ground, and they will go away. So. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still alive. <laughs> uh, this was, was, a, uh, was a good uh, session. Um, there was a small uh, photo hide made by the BBC for some years ago. They were filming up there. And a, a small pond or small lake. Uh, and the owner told me that uh, there were supposed to be two to three bears that, um, yeah, not every night, but they are tend to, to have, have a swim. Quite warm, a lot of mosquitoes. So they used the water actually to, to cool themselves and take the old the shit mosquitoes away. Uh, it's quite small, once again, it's like a coffin. Um, I had my 800 millimeter, my 600 millimeter, millimeter and my 70 to 200. And when the first bear come out, it was on a quite good distance. But after a half an hour, I have it, this is taking me the 70 to 200. <laughs> and this also, I can smell the bear, of course, hear it because it was playing in the water. And it's coming straight to me. So this is taking on two meters. My God. Oh, yeah. Uh, I wasn't afraid, I think, but I was okay. This is quite close now. And you were in the water. No, I was on the photo height. On okay. the on the yeah two centimeters Land. from okay. from the pond. Okay. Uh, but when I moved myself, actually, the whole photo height was oh, moving yeah. a little. So thinking it's, if if the spirits. Uh, maybe try to take me i will take the whole photo hide out in the water so <laughs> but still the both the bear and me have a, a blast so okay then we go back to norway um the, the, pand the pandemic have made my traveling plans quite um, narrow but uh, so the last year i had i think 11 workshops in norway uh, on the white tail eagle we have three spots in norway that's very good for to to, to take pictures okay. of the white tail eagle and um, I'll always, well, not always, but I'll bring all my, my, my 800 millimeters because this picture is taking, it's not cropped, it's the picture. Mm. Because if you take uh, like this frame and maybe take out the, the claw and the fish in the water, if you want that, yeah, like a cool picture on, on Facebook, what's gonna happen then? Maybe some people will say that, okay, I want this picture on the wall uh, in a big screen, let's say, mm one meter two meter two meters maybe and it's quite a uh, bad feeling to tell the clients uh, sorry you can't have that because i have cropped my file so much you can <laughs> too small so i can i will maybe crop maybe 10 percent 50 percent of so sorry 20 percent but not anymore so this is the whole picture um also this taken with the 800 millimeter uh, of course, I, I missed some shots um, in between, but uh, when you play along with the, the white tail eagle for some days, some weeks, some years, then you know the, the pattern that they fly. You can see that uh, you, you try or you manage to follow the bird when they fly. 
But uh, this is taken from, from, from the boat. I will go back on this one. Um, the boat is maybe one meter of, of, um, above the sea level. So two years ago, still, um, I made a new ID that the, the, the eagle stairs, Rogers eagle stairs, stairs. So I can go actually down in the water. Uh, and the first time I tried it, you see, uh, you can sit on, on the stairs on, on the lowest um, platform. Here we go, the first um, day I tried it. And uh, I think that this was the first picture I tried to take of the eagle. And the eagle come from the right hand side and turn around and see a ho, he ho, she saw an idiot in the water and abort mission. <laughs> <laughs> so they used some hours to, um, to preparing the eagles that this idiot was not dangerous. So uh, after some days, I have my, my dream shot. Taking with the 200 aperture two, and uh, as you can see, it's quite is maybe two centimeters above the sea level. Yes, yes. So, um, and what I like actually to, to be, uh, let's say, a professional nature photographer, I, I will I use all my spare time. I always have a um, pen and paper. I will write down some ideas that I have, um, some new things to to make to have the, my life even better. The bear box, the, the eagle stairs, the stairs, and I have a, quite another some new features. I will show you next time. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, sure. that's uh, quite cool actually to, to think, try to think uh, new, and and if because if you let's say take the eagle uh, as a good example, because the first time you see them, they are happy, more than happy. They have some good shots. The eagle in the middle. Uh, and then the next time, maybe you uh, think about the, the backlight, maybe um the shutter speed you have a panorama whatever and after some years you have to you um not have to but i like to to think yeah. in new ways and this is one of the way you can take it hmm. uh, another bird that i use a lot of time with is uh, the owl um and uh, i use my binoculars a lot because uh, this time of year in norway they start uh, hatching maybe some weeks ago now, it's quite cold still in Norway. So when I first find them, I use my binoculars to, to find um, the hunting area. And uh, this is a flat light, it's a boring light, but I use maybe one or two days to actually use my binoculars because I don't want to disturb them. Uh, so I can go back again when the light is better. Yeah. Using the, the backlight because they have the, uh, the, 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 the same spot Every night, maybe it's six, 10, 15 um, trees, so cut trees mm. that, uh, to, to watch off the mouse and, and praise, of course. So um, I love the owl. Uh, this is uh, taken one year ago. And this uh, technique is quite good to, uh, to, to practice on because quite uh, the hush light. And on the find uh, is, is a cub, the great uh, gray owl. And I use my, uh, my flash. But I use it on on the um, uh, rare function. That means I have a shutter speed on twenty five of a second, and that uh, that means the the flash will flash on the end of the exposure, and that means the the backlight will hit the the sensor first, and I use my flash. I have put it down maybe one point seven eb uh, step to just have a little bit light in the eyes. So that is quite a good way to take those kind of pictures. Because if you use a flash, not on the rear, but on the normal uh, function, the background is will be black. But the eye want to actually to have the, 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 the light in from, from behind. And the only way to do that is to use the flash on rear. Uh, but the sync um, speed on the normal Nikon flash is 250 of a second. So you will not see that um, big difference be between between normal flash and on the second or at the end of the exposure. So if I use so once again the shutter speed uh, between 15 and maybe 30 of a second, then we have that kind of a light. So mm -hmm. next time we will take pictures in in bad light, and we will have a little, little light on on the eyes on the lion or the owl. Yeah. Try and use that technique. Yeah. Uh, once again, um, the bigger owl. Uh, I use my back back button focus. 
Uh, once again, I, I will use some hours, maybe some days, to find out where the hunting area is uh, and where I can put myself and not to disturb the, the hunting. And here you see uh, the, good, the good example to have uh, the back button focus. Uh, because you can, on the Nikon system, uh, you, can, you can tell the back button focus, whatever, that uh, have a long memory. Because when you put it up, it's, uh, it's I think, five steps. Step one is fast. That means um, the autofocus, the, the lock to the focus is quite short memory. I put it on five. That means uh, 25 meters of stray and straw that the bird fly, fly behind. But my memory on the focus is quite long. So it, I will have the whole series when the will fly behind something. And if you will make an article about the silent hunter and so forth, that's a good way to actually show that the mystique of a bird that you can't hear them. You can just see them behind and everything. So uh, I like the, the butt button focus. Mm. Uh, and of course, uh, play along with the, the moon and everything. This is uh, this is planned. I was planning it some, for some days and put myself in the in this uh, in the perfect spot to have it. So you can take a lot of good pictures. Just um, it's not like snapshot, or whatever. But uh, I like to to have a plan in almost everything I do. Okay, then we go down on the ground again in India, of course. And can you see what that is? <laughs> a cobra. Yes, a cobra. The mm -hmm. female. And uh, if you remember the film that called uh, Crocodile Dundee. Yeah. 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 The crocodile, they have to try to have a, I think it was a water buffalo or something to have put it into sleep, doing it like that. <laughs> oh, Don't yeah. do that on a cobra. <laughs> because I think that female was um, another snake now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it was a cool layout at the office. So this is the picture I took with the uh, 24 to 70 on wow. 24 millimeter. I like the, the backlighting there. But uh, I also like have a, a something in the, in the foreground. So this is it was taken with a six hundred millimeter. And the same snake, but uh, then I have uh, I can shoot through the grass between me and and the cobra, mm -hmm. and also the bouquet is quite good behind. It's an aperture four. But uh, was there anybody uh, to handle the snake, or it was a wild one? That is a wild one, of course. We. Oui. Yeah, uh, I almost never take picture of, of animals in captivity. I mean, it's not about captivity, but then, uh, you know, cobras can be really a risk, especially yeah. that close encounters. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I have um, my main kind of scary thing. I love snakes. So I travel <laughs> the world and find the most scary ones. Not to make a list of the most deadliest snakes or whatever, but I have a lot of, a lot of lectures about snakes up in Norway and at, in schools and so forth. Okay. I will try to take the mystique and the uh, the harshness of beautiful animals. Um, and if you show these pictures to somebody that are afraid of snake, I will give them a lot of fun facts about the snake, okay. how important they are, and how you supposed to react next time you see them. So. Um, but yeah, it, this is still a thing. Oh my god! <laughs> this is an eighty-five millimeter uh, aperture, one point four. But I knew that uh, if you see a cobra, they're starting to um, to have the the head back and forth. That's a signal that they will maybe attack you or whatever. Mm. I also know that uh, the, the the length of the, of the bite or the attack reach. Is the height of the snake. So that means it's 50 centimeters high, then you can bite or throw it 50 meters, 50 centimeters <laughs> towards you. So I'm trying to actually, but I've never been attacked by a cobra. I've been quite close, but never have been bitten. Oui. Oh. But you're lucky. <laughs> or actually, I was lying now because I actually have been that. I will show the picture. Um, this is from taken from above to sh to show the uh, the binoculars on on yeah. back. Uh, the last time I was in India, I think that's two years. No, I think I was uh, out with the family to take in the um, uh, the harvesting season, and then I removed seven cobras from the field. Oh, 
because uh, the, the small children uh, and the oldest people, but the, the children was out there and take the um, uh, the yeah the grass back to the farm, okay. and we found seven of them underneath mm. uh, the grass they were picking up. So yeah, beautiful. Okay. This one actually, this uh, <laughs> 16 millimeter, and this snake <laughs> bite my my lens. Oh, what? but I was uh, holding my camera uh, quite in the eve, not a female grip, but I don't tell my my left arm un under the lens. I was like holding a little bit on, on the back. <laughs> so I actually have to take some poison away from the lens suit. <laughs> oh my God. But um, still, it's a nice little fellow. <laughs> this one, on the other hand, um, the, that that is the first picture I took and took from the, the king cobra. Oh my hmm. god! I was up in the Casaranga to try to capture the um, the rhinos up there. And early morning, uh, I think six half or six in the morning, quite cold in April. Uh, and after, and my driver was. Afraid like hell because this snake was in the middle of the road when they, when they find it in the morning, quite cold. They had um, gloves and a jacket. And after Andy asked me, that well, he told me, don't go out the, from, from the car, please. Mm -hmm. Of course, I did, did that. I was laying on underneath the car and I used my 200 to 400 and 600 millimeter on that guy. And after, after 10 seconds, I was warm like hell because the adrenaline was uh, pumping high. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a perfect, uh, a, a beautiful snake, I think. It is, but <laughs> yeah. the risk is unbelievable. <laughs> I will never even dare to step out. <laughs> no, but uh, still, if you want to, uh, I, I, I took some picture from 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 the car, but uh, I love the low angle in this yeah. picture and the other picture, so I want to to show that instead of from two meters above it and straight yeah. down on the road, yeah. on, on yeah. the side of the road. And you Makes see sense. the character in it, its eyes, it, it's like every bit of it is like, I hope I won't get nightmares. <laughs> yeah, but I still um, I will, I will, I will try to capture the heart of the image like I can uh, say in the advertising. Yeah. But, I will try to actually, because if you look at, uh, at at the snake from two meters above or from the car, that's the, the angle that almost every people see a snake. Yeah. Yeah. And if you go on the same level as, as the snake, you maybe find the personality, even though the snake don't have any personality. But maybe some people say that this is quite maybe this is a little bit angry because the tongue is out. Yeah, tongue tongue is out and it yeah. sense it. At, uh, it's a beautiful, a beautiful snake. This is one was not looking at me. We can study it. It's like what your beauty. Yeah. Um, so and also hopefully uh, because in Norway we only have three type of snake, one poisoned, and that's uh, um, I think one person every ten year get killed by this viper, the common European viper. Okay. Um, um, but if you look uh, worldwide, the number is maybe three hundred and fifty thousand people get killed by snakes every year. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so those numbers is too high, and once again in Norway, people kill that poison snake because they are so afraid, and that snake is actually not so poisoned. This one, um, yeah. <laughs> I will understand if people kill it if you have yeah. it in the house and so forth. But uh, still in India, and I knew at least ten guys down there, full time rescuer from from snake to take them out from the small villages in the houses and so forth, and they don't kill them, you just move them. So yeah, I like, I like it, that. Yeah, it, we we don't. I mean, it's it's more of cultural. I believe. Yeah, we consider yeah. in certain religion, it's considered as a god, a sign yeah. of god. Yeah. So we we have one more question on that. Cobras are also known uh, to spit venom. Have you ever had such an incident? Yes. Every time, and I take picture of the cobra and also the the Russell Pitt, the, sorry, the Russell Pitt viper. Yeah. Uh, always use glasses. Uh, I will only use glasses when I'm reading um, because I'm old. But um, <laughs> with those guys, I always <laughs> have uh, protective glasses. Okay. And I and I also keep my mouth shut mm. in all times because you because of the Russell Pitt Viper, one third of them yeah can spit on you. 
Oh. And the, the cobra, some of them also, as you know, can spit. Yeah. And you have that uh, poison in your mouth or in the, or in the eye. Mm -hmm. Bad situation. So, <laughs> yeah, Anyhow, that is. We go back, I think we go back to Norway now. And yeah. this is the main reason that I moved up to the mountains of Dovre one year ago. Uh, and the Moscots, Moscots, we have approximately 220 individuals up in the mountain. And I have worked with them, I think, 18 years old. This is, um, I think, six weeks ago in a snow blizzard. Uh, I have a lot of pictures of them, of course, but every day, every situation are unique. So I'm as much as excited that that was the first time I saw them. Um, around 400 kilo. Uh, runs up to 60 km per hour, so it's quite fast animals, and they will kill you if, if they have the chance. Um, but for the last, I think, 20 years, I think it's two persons that have been killed by them, unfortunately, but um, still. So here are the, the big bull, and they are, as long as they're eating, sleeping, and so forth, they, are, don't, they don't bother if they are around them. So I was laying down, I think, for two hours in the snow just to wait for, they will wake up and shake the, the snow from the fur. Oh. And uh, once again, like the bear and the snake, if you are calm and because I'm quite high, 1.9 meters, but uh, if, we, if I crawl, don't make myself as big as I'm actually I are. <laughs> and they can recognize me, not like me, my personally, but they will see I'm there, but I'm laying down. Okay, do what do everybody want. I'm going to eat, sleep, and so forth. Um, and once again, I will try everything to have another picture, a new ID, backlighting, like this one. And this, you can see actually the, the sun, and the exposure is 8,000 of a second, aperture 264 ISO. And please remember, don't look through the lens against the sun, because your eyes will burn. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and it looked like maybe the moon or something, but I, I will uh, underexpose as much as it gets. So, once again, a plant shot, a small, small animal. And this is uh, not the, the national mountains in Norway, but uh, for me it is. This is the snow, uh, snow hetta in Norwegian, uh, snow hill in English. And uh, every east, or so from, uh, let's say September, October, I have maybe two or three weekends with, um, with workshops. Because then we have snow on the tops, so we have the color on, on the mountainside. And this is the icon picture of all the people that have a hut up in this area. They want the, the, their mountain and the muskox in, in front. Mm. Uh, on the top of the mountain, some years ago, I think two years ago, I started on 200 meters um, because we have a sunset that, that was more or less perfect. I was ending up approximately five meters from us. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, and I like the, the, the fur and the everything. And a good tip for that one, because uh, if this picture had been taken, let me say, um, 2.8, aperture 7200 to 2.8, and they, on the aperture 2.8, the everything or well, the only thing you can see now is the fur and the, the glory kind of thing. So what I did on this picture, I use aperture 9, because every little fur, the hair is pin sharp. Mm. Because from uh, from the, the first fur on the nose and maybe then down to the uh, stomach, whatever area, could be a half a meter. So if you have an aperture or uh, the depth of field from a 2.8 aperture, the nose may be clear, but uh, on on the back of the head or under underneath the, the yeah to the stomach area, it will not appear as sharp as I want it. So that's a good uh, thing to do underexposed and use the aperture or not only the the shutter speed yeah okay. <laughs> wow Another, uh, favorite of mine of course is the uh, the arctic fox i've been to svalbard uh, i think 11 times and up there I have a lot of uh, arctic foxes on the mainland of norway i think that we have approximately 250 adults uh, maybe every year between 20 and or between zero and up to maybe 45 50 cubs 
but uh, every winter 77 you know, i think 70 percent of them die because they are bad hunters they have a lot of animals uh, enemies the wolverine the red fox the, the brown eagle uh, so I knew about I think 14 different places in Norway I can I can capture the Arctic coast. Mm -hmm. I also used my my bear box on the 14 millimeter, and it's quite easy to if you knew knew the area that you can find the Arctic fox because they are don't afraid of people, they are curious, and uh, because um, people uh, I think uh, for 20 years ago we have almost none of them because people have killed them for for the fur. For some hundreds of years so uh, but they, they, they don't shoot them they have uh, some some traps or some they kill them in, in instantly to have the fur in perfect condition so they are not learning that people are are dangerous and uh, at least two puppies or well, they are, i think three months old playing around the camera like hell and this is Maybe three, maybe about five centimeter from my fourteen millimeter lens, so it's quite close. <laughs> uh, but once again, um, I mentioned my six hundred millimeter. I like a foreground on the back drop, and the aperture four makes that um, bouquet like butter once again. And of course, the low perspective once again. Yeah. Because I want uh, the, uh, the the playfulness of uh, there's a mother on the top and the two cups. Uh, this night did they play along? I think for one hour. I was laying in, underneath, um, um, yeah, what you call a yerbenduk. That means a uh, camouflage, not a net, <laughs> not, not not a tent, but a camouflage kind of coating kind of thing. Yeah. Because I, I don't want them to look at me. I want them okay. to look uh, to play to hunt. Most mm -hmm. play, of course like this one because uh if i'm gonna stand there 1.9 meter in the tripod and show myself they don't want to play that much because they have used the time to actually look at me and try to figure out who's this bastard <laughs> <laughs> but laying on, on the stomach also stomach and just not make any sounds so you can have those pictures and of course once again the sunset and the, the rim light and two trillions of mosquitoes in the back Oh light. my God. Oh. What a shot. Can you please <laughs> share the story behind this one? Yeah, of course. Uh, there was a summer night in, I think it's July, and a lot of mosquitoes. And I didn't bring any uh, oil with me or some whatever. They was laying there because they was playing on some, some rocks. And I was uh, hoping that they will stand up there for two seconds or more. So this um, was a night, and is there any artificial flash or light or no. anything? It's a, the, the sunset start, I think, maybe one hour before the sun went down. Bent down. So it's a hill on the okay. back side. Okay. So you see uh, the, the foreground on the background is in the shadow. Yeah. The sun was only one strip of light over the hillside. Wow. So, yeah, it's a good, good uh, night at the office. <laughs> wow. And once again, this is a little bit underexposed, but I use my aperture nine to have all the fur on the on the both of the uh, article yeah. quite sharp. And of course, this picture. Um, maybe some of the some of you have heard it before, but I think uh, this is four years since I took it. I think or something, but I, I used ten years. So that means mm -hmm. uh, fifteen years ago, we had the crazy idea to have the. Um, because I, I see some some drawing, I think, on the wolf howling on the full moon. I don't think ever nobody have taken that picture yet, but still. So I was thinking, what about the Arctic fox against the uh, the moon? That's crazy. That's not going to happen. But I, I had to try. And at that time, I was living in Oslo. <coughs> Sorry, I was driving up there for four and a half, maybe five hours. I, I wasn't up there every full moon for 10 years but i was up there maybe four or five six times every year to try to capture the um, this frame and this was uh, taken in the end of september in 2014 i think now or 15 times goes anyhow uh, in august the same year i was when i drive up there seven for eight hours because i was living in sweden that year uh, and the weather forecast was perfect 
and was up there maybe one hour before the moon comes up and 10 minutes maybe 50 minutes before the moon come up is one cloud on that spot where the moon comes up oh i missed the shot it was like a lot of swearing and fuck <laughs> everything and went back eight hours and i was thinking okay this is ain't gonna happen but after four weeks you forgot about all the misery so I went up there again and I was a little delayed because of the traffic jam. So I was up there maybe 50 minutes before the moon was supposed to go up on, on the hillside. And I have 7.2 minutes from the moon come up on the hillside to the actually went up to the too high in the sky. And I think that was one of my best day at the office. Uh, I have the assistant with me. Uh, I have three cameras. I use the 200 to 400, 400 aperture 2.8, and my 600. And I was filling the buffer on every camera. So, Evan, my former assistant, was like a no surgery, give him a new camera because I'm filling up the, um, uh, yeah, not the memory cards, but um, anyhow. This is me. unbelievable. And I remember this was a cover shot for your, you know, for our magazine. This was in that particular edition's cover as well. Oh, nice to hear. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have some more, more pictures. Uh, actually, uh, uh, this was taken two weeks ago, last weekend. Yeah, two weeks. Uh, the Atlantic Puffin. We have a couple of spots in Norway. Uh, this is the most southern born uh, bird nest or birding area for the Atlantic Puffin. Uh, taken with the 24 millimeter, actually. Um, Normally, I, because the, the closest you can get these birds are maybe half a meter. But normally, people stand uh, on a little distance, you use maybe 200 millimeter, 400 millimeter, and so forth. But I also like to go the other way to use the wide angle to show the area. So uh, they don't fly away uh, when they no. see people around. Okay. No. Once again, if you lay down on the ground, you just wait out because I knew where the, the nesting area is. You, uh, this is not allowed to go down in the main area. It's okay. a fence, actually. So it's a yeah. popular, popular place. Um, if you just, uh, stay still, um, they yeah. can approach you. Okay. Uh, this is a nesting time in April. And they use grass to have uh, the new matters <laughs> in, their, in their nests. Mm. So I had a workshop under uh, the first weekend in May. So this was taken in that that weekend and once again i will try to have a good foreground and the background if then i have both the foreground and the background melting together i like uh, the especially this kind of colors cool. um four weeks ago i was laying into for two nights up in an area in um, yeah in the middle of norway and we had i think 10 hairs playing it is playing time for them so uh, they, they start coming out around half past nine in the evening, and they fight until five in the morning. <laughs> and we use the two backlights. We have an artificial light uh, in, in the, yeah two meters behind them, and allow the the that kind of both the uh, shutter speed. It is quite is uh, at um, sixteen hundred of a second aperture five point five point six, and ten thousand ISO. Oh, and and what are those particles behind? Uh, that's snow, snow and okay. fur. Okay. And also, of course, use uh, shutter sp shutter speed on one twenty five because they are boxing like uh, Muhammad and Muhammad Ali, <laughs> 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 like playing along with them. And of course, uh, the last night we have a snow blizzard. It was uh, the wind shield was up to I think twenty five meter per second, so it was like it was not a storm but a snow blizzard. And uh, you can see the snow was blowing away on, on, the, on the ground. And also heavy snow. Oh, cool. So, it was not only fighting, but also putting still. And of course, we uh, used some, some bait for them. We had some, uh, some corn on some small spots, but they are around that small hut. And it was quite easy, but uh, a lot of waiting, of course. <laughs> a little bit uh, scary because um, the 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 flying here was uh, eating 
and the other one tapping <laughs> him on the, on the on the back, <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> so, quite funny. So that was all my picture. I hope you liked it. Excellent. Wonderful. We loved it. <laughs> loved it. Like us a very small way. We loved it from the beginning till this time. There is not a second I managed to take off my eyes from the screen. It's spectacular and thank you. <laughs> Each and every photo that we're Please. taking. Unbelievable. What a play of light, man. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, as I said uh, from, from the beginning, I, I like my lectures to be two and a half hour because uh, normally and some of my colleagues they are maximum maybe 30 minutes 45 minutes and that's for me is uh, like a pain in the ass yeah because i want to tell tell stories because yeah and i'm attend to the big uh, photo festivals and so forth i of course look at the, the people before me and the day after me and so forth and they're showing a perfect picture and another perfect picture, and another perfect picture, like uh, one air moves, one elephant, whatever. And after 10 minutes, it's like, whew. <laughs> <laughs> Rest of my case, not boring, but uh, there's no story behind this. It's like a perfect picture in whatever. But I like to, to I think all my lectures or, or presentation are the, they have the story behind it, the, the technique I use, uh, maybe have a, a storyline on the mountain here or Arctic foxes um, and yeah, storyteller because I'm also a journalist, so I write a lot of articles about this, those animals. And then, once again, my humor is quite bad. <laughs> no, it was really cool. <laughs> and in fact, you took only one hour, we were thinking of two and a half hours. No, oh, sorry, I didn't look at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so we can we can make him sit for more. <laughs> more yeah, time. we can make him sit for more. We, we have a question from uh, Captain. Uh, what are the key plannings and logistical points behind your uh, breath uh, breathing mist shots? I think uh, he's talking about the uh, first the, bird yeah. shots you have shared. Yeah, well, okay, the the the, the black roos. Yes. Yes. Uh, up in Norway, they start um, the youngster. They start playing. At the end of March, uh, and after maybe two weeks, the uh, the old guys, so because of the, the one spot that I was visiting this year and last year, I think we have up to fifty uh, male black roos. Okay. And the last week in April, more or less, the females come out. So they're they they're, they're fighting for two to three three weeks, more or less. And the last week in April, they are the mating season. Okay. Um, but uh, the, ten, the last 10 years, they are actually moved because uh, the last week in April is all, was almost the, um, the the female week, what we call it. But uh, they are changed maybe one to 10 days before now. So in the middle of April, because the temperature and everything, uh, we have a heavy snowfall this year. So there was uh, this year was quite late again. But last year, there was the no snow in the middle of April. So we have maybe 10 days, 15, two weeks. With the high, the high season of the the fighting, uh, I'm going up to uh, the north of Norway on Wednesday in Kirkenes, that uh, the main up north uh, to, uh, to, as you can get in in Norway. So up there is uh, maybe two weeks later than down here in the middle of Norway. So that is a quite a long country. So. Okay. So we have a question from Nader Salyani. Do you do any northern lights? Yeah, I do. Uh, a lot of them, actually, because it's quite easy to sell. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have uh, this year, or because the, I think it's a cycle on seven years from top to, to bottom. It's not the mathematics, but uh, still. So I think two years ago was on a high peak. Uh, once again, I like a foreground. If you look at my uh, Instagram or Facebook site or whatever, you can find some Northern Light pictures. Uh, because up here where I'm now, uh, like I told in, in the start, one hour ago, uh, is the, the, the polar circle. And above the polar circles is quite often we have a very good known light. Uh, above that circle is not so often. But okay. uh, yeah, but in, in Oslo, we can see the, the green light and people take the picture of, of the sky, really green. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I do like, ooh. Uh, <laughs> like a foreground. 
maybe a mirroring in a lake, a tree that can have a depth of feeling in, in, the, um, in, the, in the frame. So once again, I have a cell phone with some apps that can tell me. And uh, last night we have a um, uh, index that fine point six, I think. That's very good. But once again, during the summer season, we have a light all around. So it's not dark enough in the in summertime. Okay. So, have, have you ever had any images, um, I mean, northern light with a subject in front other than a tree or any species, maybe? Of course. <laughs> okay. I would love to see that. I'll go through your field once again. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 I've, I've, the, the plan for, for the next winter is to have the muskoxes in the northern light. Oh. Uh, oh yes. Yes. That's never gonna happen. No, I haven't haven't seen that picture yet. <laughs> I, will, I, I, will, I, will, I don't want to, to tell every idea that I have because <laughs> ah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But uh, I will, of course I will try that. Uh, this winter I tried some some nights, but we have a lot of snow this winter, and every time it's a good um, northern light season or some days. I was in Kenya. Oh, the, okay. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we we already have a request for the next session to focus on northern light. So I will have a request to you soon. I would like to show uh, because uh, this those pictures I have shown now is uh, just a small part of my big lecture. But I have a lot of pictures from from um, Antarctica and Arctis. That means Svalbard, yeah. and polar bear, and the whales and the seals and everything. So I would love to come back and show some more pictures. Yeah, sure. That's great. We will, Maybe we'll next month we can it. add in one more. Yes. And, and also a lot of pictures because I've been to India, I think, 10 times. Oh. So a lot of tigers and other things. But I, mean, I will reckon that you guys have more pictures of the tigers <laughs> than me. But also I love this, uh, Sri Lanka. I've been there five times. Uh, okay. Mongolia, a favorite of mine. Uh, mm. Yeah, so. There's a lot of unshown pictures. Great. Yeah. We Great. have more sessions coming up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, what about you doing maybe tomorrow at, at, at breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you are free, we are OK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have so, more questions uh, for you. Yeah, yeah. come on. What, uh, like what's your favorite location for wildlife photography? Mm. I think maybe I have to say Svalbard. That means the polar bear area. Yeah. Um, next year, I will, or well, this year, I hope to go to, to Yellowstone in September. Okay. Pink first. It depends on the COVID 19. Yeah. Uh, going to Indonesia uh, in October. Pink okay. first. Uh, but the next year, I'm going to Kamchatka. I haven't oh. been there yet. Uh, I think you wish I've been there. Yes. yes. I'm gonna hold a, a workshop down there in no up there in August next year. So that's gonna be another big. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. But as, as, as more as I travel because I've traveled around the world. Um, I've been to Antarctica two times, uh, Svalbard a lot of times, uh, Africa all over. But still, I meet you guys, another guy or girl, or whatever, and they show me another place that they haven't been. To. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine some years ago, she asked me, haven't you seen it all now? Haven't you been all over? I was like, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> because uh, like I told you about the, the mosques, the mosque oxes, I have yeah. worked with them for 18 years. I'm as much excited tomorrow that I was 18 years ago. Because of the new situation, they're fighting, the light, the northern light maybe, the full moon. Uh, snow blizzard, uh, the rainbow, so many. Uh, yeah, they maybe take a bath or running through a water, <laughs> or whatever. So, uh, but still, I'm I'm up in let's say tonight. Actually, I've, I've finished talking to you guys. Soon. Um, I'm gonna drive because this I've uh, been eight hours in the cave, so I'm not <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but me and uh, my colleague of mine, we're gonna go out um, on a moose hunt. Or, or I call it a moose safari. Um, that means I have a travel. Let's see if we can find this one. If you can see the whole thing. Yeah, to some uh, extent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the eight, one hundred eight to the four hundred. 
okay. And of course, the small one, the 800 millimeter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so when I'm actually driving, I have my 600 in my, uh, like this. <laughs> Because if, if you're lucky to see a let's say a lynx or even a moose or whatever a bird, yeah. If you have the camera in the in the back, or yeah, it's like that. You see the lynx. You have to stop the car, of course, and yeah. turn around and pick up the camera. That takes maybe one or two seconds. Yeah. And it's stuck back there, and two seconds more, <laughs> and and we are the lynx. So I have it. <laughs> And uh, now no, we have uh, still the sun, I think, for, yeah, maybe five hours more. So I will start uh, my tr my driving um, session uh, now and think the shutter speed, 1250 of a second, aperture 5.6, I'm at 800 ISO. And in the one hour from now, I maybe a double the ISO to 1600. And oh. after two hours, I go from 1250 of a second down to 640 of a second, maybe aperture 4 and 1600 ISO, so I, I've tried to be preparing myself for, because the, the settings now is not going to suit my in the situation in three hours. Yeah. Yeah. So if I don't see anything in three hours or so one hour or whatever, I will, when I'm driving, because I knew my camera, blindfold, I will double the ISO, go down to the aperture or shutter speed. So if I see the, the first links of the moose in 10 o'clock in this evening, I will still have the picture because I'm, I was prepared. Great. So <laughs> no. that's amazing. One, 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 uh, one question from Shaisa. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we ask every uh, a question we ask every photographer. How do you travel with all this equipment? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I hope that nobody from the uh, air company listen now. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, when I travel, I have uh, my 600 and my D6 on the shoulder, like yes. over there. I have a quite small uh, bag from National Geographic, like this one, in my computer, and maybe uh, 2D5 and 2470, 7200. Quite heavy though, but this seems quite small. Yeah. Um, and I have a, a trolley that seems like a normal kind of businessman trolley. From uh, that name of that is um, Think Tank Air uh, yeah. Security Two. That's the biggest you can have on on commercial international flights. Yeah. And the record uh, weight of that one was thirty two kilos. <laughs> and here's the the secret: don't tell anyone. <laughs> because if you put that up on on the on the counter on the for the check in kind of thing, you are on all the ladies behind there. It's like, oh, that's a big one. And I tell them, oh, I hear that quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have broken the ice. So you can talk about that, go down to Kenya, some lions and shit, and blah, 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 and <laughs> whatever. And actually, uh, I have uh, the longest uh, the common viper in, in Norway. <laughs> <That's huge more. laughs> and I also have a, a big anaconda. If you want to see it, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but still, back to, the, back to the secret. I asked for a, a luggage tag on this one, like a um, tag. Oh. <laughs> and uh, normally they tell me, that, oh, you don't need that. Yeah, but it's quite funny to have a tag on my camera. Yeah, of course, yeah. you can have one, uh, like approved um, yeah. uh, onboard luggage. Lug luggage. Yeah. And then uh, the, the big trolley that stands behind me somewhere. Uh, and I uh, haven't seen it. So I go as fast as I can from the in-check area and that the gate. And I put the tag from the camera on that quite heavy <laughs> trolley. That's quite cool. <laughs> uh, of course, I also sponsored by the BMW. I have a hard cases, uh, like a pelle case, but from BMW in Germany. Yeah. And last time I was in Kenya, in, when I met Nisha in January, I had two quite big ones. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Um, or if I go to uh, Antarctica or another place, I always have my 600 and 7200, 20, 2470 on, on my body. Because I think it's only one time, one of my hard cases was delayed with two days in Tanzania, I think, some years ago. Mm -hmm. so that means I, I can I can start working because I have my main gear on me, always, yes. 
Yeah. So I will send maybe the 800 and whatever um, in the hard cases, of course. So, but that's, uh, yeah, the last time I was down in, in once again in, in Kenya, I spent, uh, I can't remember the, the price, but uh, the cost may maybe, yeah, $300 or something to, to pay overload or yeah. one, more, one more item. The domestic plate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Uh, because I don't, I don't like to, to put my, a lot of my gear back home because I have to spend three hundred dollars because blah blah blah. I'm yeah. going down here for two weeks, and I need my all my gear, and I use it. I don't think about too expensive or whatever. Yeah. I use yeah. it. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, but once again, uh, if you have a, uh, I, I never used like a photo vest. Like, um, I'm, I'm quite feeling like a German tourist if I have a vest with the all my gear. On. <laughs> but uh, of course, they have them. Uh, and some, or uh, I was in. I can't remember, maybe in Mongolia or Australia. I can't remember, but anyhow, it's quite. Uh, I can put two D files in in some of the pockets, yeah. yeah, pockets, and seventy two hundred on the back. Some uh, hard disks, maybe somewhere which I can put my weight, maybe up to twenty kilo, <laughs> because it's allowed to be to be fat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. okay. So that's also a good uh, way to actually uh, put it on your body uh, because I'm I think it's 100 kilo kilograms. Uh, some of the guys 150, so I can use actually 50 kilo gears on my body. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so one, one question from Udit uh, Pathak: What's your take on the ones who are against baiting, camera trapping, and artificial lights? Can you take that once again? What is your take on the ones who are against baiting, camera trapping, and artificial lights? Okay. Um, as long as you use it in the terms of the animal welfare, so to speak. Uh, take the bear in, in Finland, for a good example. Uh, there's a quite strong regulation of uh, how much you can bait or have uh, how out there. Uh, on a normal day in Finland, I can maybe put out. 10 kilo, maybe uh, like you saw the, the reindeer, um, a normal brown bear eat 40 to 50 kilo every day. And this area I'm working in, and we have maybe 15 individuals, whatever. So the amount of food I put out is maybe 10, 2% of that bear or those bears and normal intake every day. Um, but I use uh, the bait because if I have, could have the picture of the, the large um, predators you have to use bait. I also see them without, of course, but uh, always on the on the behalf of the welfare of the animals. I never use sound on birds uh, because in the mating season, if you play a, a sound of another male for another situation, then you will um, the, 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 the actual bird will use a lot of energy to try to rage me out of the area. So I never use uh, sound, um, but once again, um, I will always. If I use ten more days to have the, the picture without the sound and everything, I would rather do that. Of course, of course. But I'm in, in in India for five weeks, and if you out ten days every day, so sorry, ten hours every day, you may see tiger in one minute or zero minutes or one hour. You never know. So it's a lot of time. So anyhow, I don't use baits for all those animals, of course. It's, um, and yeah. on, another, on another hand, snakes. Um, I can handle them sometimes. On, in 99% of those times, I remove them. It's from the road, from the playing around for the children in India, for example, or taken away from, um, from people who want to kill them. And in, in that uh, situation, of course, I can take set some pictures before and after and under but so and say, but I, I don't like to interrupt or interfere with white animals. Right. And camera trapping? Uh, I don't. I don't use that. Uh, I'm quite old, so I like to actually play the <coughs> camera. On the bear box, on the other hand, I use my yeah. uh, my trigger because, but still, I am six, eight, ten meters away from from the camera, and still I like to to press the button on the. Um, yeah. On, yeah. So. Then I never used. Yeah, I have, I have them because so I have some sponsors that give that shit to me, but I, I don't use it because 
not is wrong with that, but I like actually to to mm. because I have some from some friends, some colleagues, they can sit back home and watch Netflix, and the cell phone is bling, and they have a picture of whatever <laughs> ten miles away. That's for me. Uh, no, I will uh, rather be out there and freezing and hungry. <laughs> and see myself. Have a picture. Yeah. So uh, next is how do you connect uh, photography and conservation in your life? That's a good question. Um, more and more. Because uh, let's say I take uh, the, the tiger. Uh, I've been there quite a lot, uh, bold heading lectures and working by myself. And I knew that there's a lot of people in India that don't, don't like the tiger. It's actually killing people. And to have a huge area that maybe some people want to use in another uh, thing, uh, take it, cut it, the, the, the forest away. But um, through my pictures uh, and my lectures and my articles and so forth, I can put some focus that um, the tiger actually increasing in, in numbers. I'm working very close to the World Wildlife Foundation. I've been for, I think, 15 years, another organization up here in Norway and in, in Europe and in the States. So I use my pictures and my voice to, to tell stories that uh, on other people that uh, haven't thought about the tigers and snakes and eye polar bears, whatever, actually keep themselves together. And uh, the last week I have a big, uh, some big articles about the, um, the, uh, oh, what do you call them? Hav, Suri, Norwegian. Uh, yeah, some nest nesting area, some seabirds in Norway. They use um, garbage from from the ocean to actually uh, make in some some nests, oh. uh, fishing uh, raw plastic and so forth. Mm -hmm. And this area, I think, is six thousand pair of them. Uh, and uh, when I started in that, that area for ten years ago, approximately twenty percent of the nesting area was plastic. This area is ninety percent. Oh. So I've been up there for 14 years, but uh, every year, like last Wednesday, I think, the biggest newspaper in Norway, I made a big articles. And once again, with my pictures and my voice telling about that story, because if you think about the garbage in the ocean, that problem is so huge. It's, it's unbelievable. There's so many tasks that you can't lie. I don't, I, want to, I don't want to read about it. But do you see a bird um, hanging dead? Strongly yeah. like garbage in a nest area. Yeah. Then uh, people that, and the best way, is because now we're talking about, uh, if you th think about us like a re religion, we have the same God, the nature, we knew about the animals, we like to be care about the animals, but the, not the 80% or 50% of the people in, in the world, they don't care. Yes. Whatever. Yeah. So I try to have my articles and my pictures in, in magazines that they, because those guys don't read your newspaper or new your magazines. Mm -hmm. so my, my articles in in the children uh, magazines in for the older people, for the bicycle people, whatever. So you can see my pictures and your pictures and every pictures Friday morning in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Because we guys we we uh, approach, we find the, and the information, we read the magazines about uh, conservation and so forth. But the most important thing actually to show the pictures to people that don't have to take any stand on it. And that means quite a lot of people also in Norway. Because if you have a big article, so a lot of words about uh, the pollution in the, in the ocean, okay. it's like next page, next page, or oh, there's cartoons, I can read that. <laughs> but uh, if you have big pictures, uh, and fun, fun fact, it's not nothing fun about the pollution, but if you have some fun fact, and you can see actually the death in the, in, in the eye on the, beautiful bird strangling in something you maybe throw out in the ocean yesterday. It's like, mm, oh, maybe next time I'll take my bar garbage back home after a party on the ocean or whatever it's coming from. So it's a big issue. And uh, once again, uh, maybe 20% of my work now, maybe more, is about that uh, importance about the pollution. Uh, we uh, also in Norway we have the the problem with um, the wine mills, okay. uh, killing birds. Uh, we destroy nature, making new roads, new factories. Uh, we use the nature as like crazy up here also. So uh, we do try to have some some exhibitions, uh, lectures all over to 
also for the, for the government because those guys are the sick bastards. So it's everything about the money, and if you can show people that uh, this forest is quite rare, the trees is quite rare, the animals, the plants living in that area is rare, rare. So if we give them a chance and opportunity and understatement that we have to protect it, because yeah. for some people, a, a forest is a forest. Yes. Yes. A lot of forests in other places. We can take this. No, yeah. We don't have that. So. Hmm. Yeah, it's always hard when it comes to conservation and convincing people or to at least influencing people. It can be really a tiring thing. Yeah. So with actually a lot of my colleagues, not a lot of, but some of my colleagues, they don't use the, the strong voice that they could have. They just take the pictures in the good light, like I do <clears throat> in between, of course, and show only the, those pictures. Um, I have also a picture of dead Arctic foxes, of dead polar bears, and dead birds. Mm. Of course, that uh, was supposed to be there with the waterfalls that's gone. Uh, but I've taken, because they, they take the, yeah, only the beautiful pictures. Of course, I do that myself, but I also turn around and look behind me on the road, on the airport area, whatever, and find some spots that are not so good or supposed to be that, but uh, they are destroyed. Yeah. Nice. So um, once again, I, I use my, my voice as often as I can. Not too high, because if you're angry at people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, if you made them make them understand by themselves, yeah. by reading reading or listen to um, into you on radio or called television or your platform, people yeah. are like, oh yeah, they are they're making up their own uh, understandable kind of thought about the nature. That's um, the best way to do it. Yeah, true, true. We need to feel the same. At least, at least a handful of people, at least one person. You know that makes yeah. difference. Yeah. Yeah. So we have one question from again graphite and paper. How do you keep yourself warm in extreme cold weather, especially your hands? Uh, drinking whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very warm, uh, warm clothes. Uh, I'm a sponsor there also, but um, I will, yeah, there's no point to mention them. But I have um, very good shoes because uh, the the foot, the feet is the uh, the weakest points. And uh, normally, when I'm go, uh, let's say from from my house or whatever in the area, maybe skiing for two three hours or, or shoes uh, snowshoes, uh, I always get warm. I'm sweating on the on the back or maybe on the, on the, on, the, on the feet. So I will uh, go uh, two, three hours or whatever. I will change my under, uh, not underwear, but my on, under clothing because I'm sweating on, on the back. And if we have, uh, let's say, 30 degrees below zero, it's quite freezing, a lot of wind. It's quite hush to change, take your clothing off. I also do that because if you're sweating on, on the back, you're going to get cold after one hour, whatever, two hours. Mm -hmm. uh, also with the shoes, when I'm going on skiing, I have my warm shoes, little big, heavy thing, kind of thing on my backpack, and I put them on when I'm arriving the scene. Um, three layers of wool, and I have a jacket, and, and, and thick and better, better warm. Uh, and of course, gloves. I have under gloves, like uh, maybe fingers. I have a big gloves on top of that. I can take the uh, other other thing off. So I have my my pointing finger or my two fingers uh, really reachable. And of course, I can use some electrical warmth in the gloves, but then again, it's get too hot. So when you get too hot, you're sweating, and sweating get cold, and it's more, yeah. yeah. So a lot of layers. That's the best way because if I have um, just maybe three layers and quite the thin layers, so it's better to have actually a big, big jacket that's bigger than you actually need because then you have uh, air between the layers in the clothing. But a uh, freezing thing is, yeah. But still, um, I'm um, I'm freeze my uh, my feet off maybe because a couple of times because I have an ID. I want that pictures, and you don't feel the the, the coldness before after <laughs> whiskey and have a fireplace. <laughs> cool. And what do you consider as the biggest achievement so far in your photography journey? Ooh, uh, talking to you guys. 
Uh, that, that's a good, that, that very good, good question uh, and very difficult to have a proper answer because um, but what I like about it uh, I can try I will travel I'm now actually 10 hours drive from a home up north in a small city called Moirana uh, and when I go to the shop up here I meet people that uh, come against me and say hello Roger I'm thinking who the fuck are you I haven't seen him before, and they can talk to me for five minutes. And yeah, I have saw the boss in in Kenya last week or whatever, and so forth. And yeah, and I'm still thinking, who are you? I haven't seen him before. But once again, I have a lot of lectures, so people recognize me and so on and forth. At the end of that uh, conversation, they tell me that oh, so I have maybe proper introdu introduce myself. My name is Ikari. I haven't met you before. I'm only following you on Instagram. It's like. Whew. <laughs> could not tell because I'm use all my energy to think who are you? Uh, a little bit uh, funny there, but uh, I'm actually um, it's, it's a good thing that people re recognize me all over the, not the world. Let's say in in Kenya, we met Nisha last time. That people are uh, following me. I'm really happy and very happy and proud of that because um, I, I see that my pictures have opened some eyes around. Yeah. And if they listen to my stories and read my articles and all that, maybe I can change some people to be better and whatever. And of course, uh, one third of my my professional life is to have workshops around the world. Of course, in Norway this year, but uh, normally around the world. And if people like my pictures and my, th my way of thinking, maybe they want to achieve or part participate on some of my workshops. So then that's, uh, that's a good circle. But uh, the the best picture I haven't taken that yet, uh, of course, <laughs> the articles and all, all that. But um, but I'm, I'm quite proud to to reach so far in so small amount of time because I didn't start just twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. So if I'm gonna regret one thing, I should start when I was fifteen. But then <laughs> I have another another life. So <laughs> still, I'm uh, quite proud that I'm reached so far in. That amount of time because there's yeah. a lot of good people out there yeah, yeah. very good people. so that's a great thing and one last question yeah. your uh, advice to uh, the upcoming wildlife photographers you're going to take that thing again please the upcoming your advice to the upcoming wildlife photographers i didn't hear that the new photographers what's yeah. your advice yo oh, yeah sorry yeah uh, that will be to buy Nikon, of course. Uh, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I think I need to find one species that you are, um, if you are a squirrel in your backyard or a bird on the top of your roof or a moose or a snake, whatever, try to be good at one animal at a time because I meet a lot of youngsters that uh, want to play, take the, the brown bear and the emu, everything at once. Um, Try to be a good at, let's say, the, the squirrel. You have them in the garden, maybe, or in a closed forest by, by a house. Uh, be out there in the morning and the evening, maybe put up some food for it. You can have it in the snow, not in India, maybe, but in Norway. And try to read the um, yeah the, the life circle of a squirrel. So that means you can uh, have cool jumping pictures. And to capture that, we have to learn about uh, the shutter, shutter speed, the depth of feel. So if you use uh, some weeks or half a year or two years, whatever, on one species, then you're good at that. And then you can take the next one. Of course, if you see another bird, you can take a picture of it. But uh, try to be, take one step ahead, because some people tend to have a big mouth and try to have everything in the same meal. Yeah. So try to, and I'm, I haven't studied biology. Uh, but of course, I'm a quite good field biologist now because I'm, I knew a lot about snakes and the tigers and the brown bear and everything. And if if I read uh, a lot of about brown bears or, or snakes, yeah. take take the snakes. Uh, if I read a lot about them, I will knew that uh, where they live, what they eat, um, where in the world I can find them, uh, when, which temperature they like, and everything. And you more than I read about one snake, kind of kind of type of snake, the more luck we have in the field. Yeah. Um, because of course uh, I will go out on a little bit trip to find some moose. I can prepare myself 
if I see one moose or one bird or whatever, but I will try to because I'm quite fast. I will do everything. I will. I don't use a lot of time to to capture the moment. So yeah. once again, have the camera in in your fingers, and uh, I'm talking about the gear. Uh, a lot of people ask me what you need to be a proper nature guy. Then now I will say buy a 600 millimeter. And uh, on a uh, old, old one, the, not new, but second hand. Okay. And I buy a D5 second hand. The D6 is too expensive and not so it's good, but the D5 is still a good camera or D4S, whatever. And if you're talking about Canon, you can say it, even the 600, but the um, 5D Mark III, II, whatever. Okay. Because if you buy cheap kind of thing, uh, that will affect you or your pictures. And on the uh, the 600 is the aperture, or sorry, the, the, uh, the lens that I use at, at most. If uh, you uh, if you only have afford the 300 millimeter, that means the the bear will be a little point in, in the middle and a lot of forest. <laughs> you, you can't sell that picture. You're proud of it. You're proud of it. You can learn a lot of the uh, ex uh, the experience, but to get close enough to the animals without disturbing it and so forth, you have pictures that <laughs> popping out. Yeah. And that's quite a lot of sum of money, but uh, if you want to be a bus yeah. driver or whatever, or anyhow yeah. you want to earn your money, you have some have some gear. Car the carpentry have a good saw and everything you need, but like uh, those guys, you need to spend a lot of not a lot of money, but buy second hand, learn how to use it, and every time, and work manually, uh, manual on shutter speed. Aperture, ISO, and white balance, and if you and that's a perfect place to, to learn in your own backyard. You know, know that I can hand, I can handheld my six hundred down to eighty of a second maybe, aperture four. I can press it up to twelve thousand eight hundred ISO depends. So, but that's my my outer border. Yeah. And if you don't know know that, and you have the uh, the links or the first sight of the tiger. And you're not prepared to yourself because you know that okay, you would use one hundred two thousand ISO or ten thousand ISO. Maybe the, the image will be crap. But if you know the, the the limits in yourself, the animal and the, the gear, then you are on a good way to be to take my job. And uh, on that note, uh, the can you explain the difference, like which one to go ahead with? Uh, current situation, the DSLR or the mirrorless cameras? <laughs> <laughs> I would say the DSLR, um, the full frame. Okay. Uh, I was, uh, I think that Nikon don't like me to tell, tell you this story, <laughs> but uh, uh, I have both the, the set seven and six. C7 and C6. Yeah. yeah, and both the one and the two. Uh, yeah. Mark two. Um, the the buffer on this I had I had the set oh, sorry um, the set seven two uh, in Kenya the last time, yeah. and the buffer is too little. They had some fighting between two lines, and I missed the, the last part of that fight because my camera started to think a little. Yeah. <laughs> Too, too slow. How about C6 Mark II? I think it's compared to C7 Mark II. C6 Mark II is slightly more. Yeah. Better. But, but still, I'm, I'm used to my D6. Yeah. And the D5, of course, but the D6, yeah. 14 um, frames per second, and the buffer is more than big enough. Yeah. And and I have a quite big hands, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> and the small camera is like a like a small. <laughs> <laughs> or I like the, the feeling to actually have a big camera because everything yeah yeah uh, but of course I will take a good picture with the the, the, the mirrorless so I'm quite eager to to try out the, the uh, set nine yeah I can't, I can't comment so on that one but um I think that will be a camera for me more more than this set yeah I think it's it's bigger like the shape is mm -hmm. almost size the uh, like the d6 yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly, but in the ten years from now, or five years from now, of course, of course, the mirrorless. I have some colleagues that they use uh, Sony, the I, the A A nine, whatever. A nine, A one. Yeah, and of course, they can, the can, R five, R six. Very good. So, but uh, still, 
Um, and a lot of my participants on my workshop, they have they have the, the top-notch um, cameras and lenses. Uh, we're talking about the cameras now. Okay. They can't they can't use them. Hmm. Uh, they have the, the autofocus on on the eye, uh, on some yeah. of the on R5, R6, and on the Sony system. But still, if you don't know how the white-tailed eel is coming down, yeah, to the fish. And you know that there maybe are uh, 50 sea, sea eagles, also so the, the seagulls around that bird. Quite a lot of eyes that they can copy <laughs> off your focus system. Yeah. But uh, so if you use uh, some some hours to actually look how the eagle coming down, fast down, slow, and up, fast up again, you can look at that for 10 times. Then you have the movement in your body. It's easier to, and that I, I don't need a focus, eye focus, because if you can't find the focus of the eye on a tiger, you you're too drunk. Yeah. <laughs> <Or stupid. laughs> so, uh, but of course, uh, that, that can help you a lot. Um, so I will think that uh, uh, young people uh, or just amateurs or whatever, and buy that kind of equipment and also put some and learn some knowledge about the animals. The curve that you're going to have experience on how fast that you are a better photographer is going to be much faster than than mine. I use maybe two or three years on all that shit I did. And if you <laughs> buy a mirrorless camera with a much better focus system than my D3 had for 15 years ago, <laughs> of course you will have more pictures of that wolf running or the bird flying. But still, uh, don't forget about the knowledge about the environment and the animals and the behavior. True. And uh, I have a question because you are in touch with uh, <laughs> Nikon. Is Nikon anywhere closer planning to come up with some lightweight uh, 600 mm or 400 mm or 800 mm? Prime lenses, basically. Prime lenses, anything lightweight rather. <laughs> no, the problem is mine is not that big. <laughs> then you have to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the only option. You don't see anything coming soon. Uh, actually, uh, there are there is uh, one solution that are very good, and they have to have an assistant. <laughs> <laughs> they can carry a lot. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> one one last question we got: How do you develop uh, the skill to see and play with light? Example, for example, the pictures with hairs. Um, also, a good question. Uh, that means um, if you have a dog or a cat or a horse or a jeep, whatever, uh, they can play with. And that means um, the next sunsets you have or sun, sunrise, uh, you can be there and playing and learn how to balance the light. And uh, like I told on the, the muskoxes, because normal people, or normally people, um, will use the, the shutter speed to underexpose. Mm. Uh, I can take my underexposed pictures um, in the midday. It seems like I'm taking in the sunset or whatever. But I will use both my shutter speed and the aperture to underexpose. Um, some of my clients or whatever people I'm, I'm at, only let's say if they have a um, yeah, 600 aperture 4, put it on aperture 4, maybe 5.6, and 4,000 of a second, and 100 ISO to underexpose. Once again, when you have the light, the, the silhouette kind of rim light, the only thing you see is the, the, the color of the sky. and the rim light, only the the fear and the hair, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important to also uh, blend down. That means um, aperture after eight or eleven or sixteen, because every little Point. hair fur is gonna be sharp. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and once again, I'm quite. Uh, I, I can look out the window now and tell you which aperture or uh, uh, yeah the exposure I need, yeah. because I'm always I've uh, been working manually. Uh, so I can. I also knew that the uh, Colibri is eight thousand of a second. The white-tailed eagle twelve hundred and fifty of a second because they don't fly as that much. Mm. If I use the six and forty, I have a little bit flare on the, on the wingtip, a little bit movement, good and nice. So I knew I'm quite good to to read which uh, aperture, oh, sorry, uh, shutter speed I need in that picture I want because I have a plan. Yeah. If you don't ever have a plan, you can have some snapshot and take pictures and whatever, but I, th I find that quite boring mm. sometimes because I, have, I, I like to have a plan. 
So uh, if, if let's say a moose standing and in, in the forest on, on a field or whatever, I will try, I will first take take one picture and check my uh, my exposure. And then my brain starts thinking, how the hell could I have that picture in a better way? Could I take my car? Could I go out of the car and shoot through the grass, through some leaves, uh, wait out the situation of the moose, maybe walk to the sun, so I have a sun behind the head, whatever. So I will try to uh, to do this to, to do the situation better than it was, and if that means another technique, another lens, uh, wait for the light, come back the next day because this area I knew that the, the owl is there, so I can go back in the next day. So once again, have a plan. Yeah. Great. I think we have covered almost all the questions. Perfect. Okay. Thank, thank you so you. much, Roger. Thank you so thank much you for the time. Coming. I'm sorry for the delay. Uh... No, no, no. No, <laughs> yeah. no. We've, I, we were actually planning after our conversation before, <laughs> we were thinking about a three hours with you. Now no. it's only one hour, 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> They'd love Hopefully. to come back again. I mean, I mean, some people out there um, want to send me a question on Facebook or mail or whatever. Please yeah. put it out there. And yeah, yes. if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can also send my message there. So I'm happy to answer everything about nature photography. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Hopefully once again for all this year. Session. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. So that was Roger. And what a show. <laughs> what a show, man. It's from the beginning to the end, you know, every minute was so entertaining in one side and so informative. On the, yeah. <laughs> the whole energy, the energy level was throughout it was so positive and yeah. uh, so much of information and so many stories you know you live you feel like you're living in those moments so that was great so whom are we planning with the next one do you have someone in your head yes on 29th we have another surprise guest which i'll be announcing soon okay another wonderful photographer okay yeah Okay, that's cool. Who, so, who, who again worked for Nagio? Woo, big guys. Yes, yes, yes. A lot of people are supporting us. Yes. A lot of people want to support, uh, right. share their knowledge, and yeah. bring more people more yes. close to nature. Yes. At the end, it's all postures is about. Bringing yes. people more bringing close people to nature. More closer to nature. Yes. Yes. So, so, if you have somebody in your head, or if any of you would like to share some of your experience from the wilderness with some spectacular imagery, get in touch with us. We would love to see your images and to share your stories. Yes, and uh, we have this uh, magazine coming up. Yeah. So if anybody want to share pictures to the uh, upcoming edition of our magazine, you can yes. log into our website, posttrails.com and submit your pictures through the, uh, we have a, a registration form. You can either yeah. register or if, you, or if you are already registered, you, you can, can log in and upload your pictures yeah. to our gallery. Yeah. We'll be publishing it. Uh, yes. Yeah. The selected That's images. So the process is this. You need to register first in case if you haven't logged in, already registered. Once you reg if you are registered, you just need to log in. And there is another button called contribute. Once you click on contribute, you get a form. So it's not just the images. If you have stories from different spec different sections in the magazine, you have an option to share your story as a Word document along with the images uh, to through the website. And we will get in touch with you if if we, if our team think it is you know good to proceed so that's the procedure and it's a platform to share your knowledge and your experience so we appreciate your support yeah and uh yeah i have uh, a good number of photographers lined up for the uh, month of june again uh, each and every photographer we uh, got we selected is brilliant amazing works yeah. So you all will enjoy the month of June as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And on that note, please take care of yourself, everybody. It's COVID yes. days. Yes. And yeah. Make sure you're using double mask. Home. Yeah. If you are going out, stay. You know, you need to make sure that you are going to use double mask and hand sanitizers with you. Social distancing is very important. Yeah, and if you are 
allowed to travel and if you want to get some fresh air yes we do have a workshop in dimara and you can get in touch with us and we can help you with the rest of the details yes we have a trip coming up uh, in july yeah 16 to 22 then july 24 to 30th and then again in the first week of august as well yeah in fact so, hermes is going to be spending most of his time uh, from july onwards till november i think in mara so yes you can get in touch with us according to your convenience too to uh, learn from, learn from hermi or um, to be in mara with us yeah okay then all right you all bye please bye take care now. stay safe yeah.